The governor of the Reserve Bank explains how money printing and inflation has eroded your purchasing power. No one is excited or proud that inflation has been outside of the target. Central banks globally, including us, as well as fiscal authorities, pumped money in to keep jobs and livelihoods going. We print a number on a piece of plastic which is an IOU that people trust because of what's behind it. It's Friday the 29th of March and you're watching Markets with Madison. Our Reserve Bank is one of a few that printed money during the pandemic to juice up our economy. The expansion of money supply has led to high prices for goods and services. The inflation we're all still feeling. The governor, Adrian Orr, personally invited me into the central bank for a tour where I asked him to explain all of the above. I'm taking you inside the Reserve Bank, the mecca of money, where how much interest you pay on your loans is decided and inflation is centrally controlled, or at least aims to be. Over the past few years, this has been a place of monetary policy firsts. It was in this exact room where the Reserve Bank decided to send rates to a record low of 0.25% and implement other measures to inject money into the economy during the pandemic. A bond buying program saw it purchase $53 billion worth of government bonds. It does that by having Treasury issue them, letting financial institutions buy them, and then the Reserve Bank buying them back on the secondary market. Alongside a bank funding program, they kept a lid on low interest rates by flushing banks with cash. Add the previous government's fiscal stimulus, and you can see the impact it had on money supply, hitting a record domestically in December 2021. While the currency we earn, the New Zealand dollar, has weakened, hitting a four-month low this week. The Reserve Bank is now attempting to arrest the overstimulation of the economy. The annual consumer price index, the Reserve Bank's preferred measure of inflation, sits at 4.7%. It's been outside the ideal target range of 1% to 3% for three years now. So the governor and his peers have hiked the official cash rate to 5.5% and held it at this height since May last year. But inflation can actually be good for governments. It erodes the real value of their debt and can lead to a higher nominal tax take. But now New Zealand is officially in a recession, possibly meaning the Reserve Bank's work to engineer a downturn is done. In this interview, Adrian and I discuss that and whether the system as we know it is working. Adrian, thank you so much for having us in. This is oh, lovely to be here. It's a privilege, yeah. Welcome. Welcome to Te Pūte Matua. Thank you. I did actually set the security meter off on the way and I forgot to swipe, so apologies in advance to your security team. That's all right. The place has been shut down um, and uh, we're reopening slowly over time. Okay, good. It feels like this is sort of a new era of transparency for the bank. Is that deliberate? Uh, we've always been highly transparent, uh, you know, open, but I don't think we've been very good at targeting our audience. I was, um, I had uh, our, was it the bulletin articles we put out and someone called it the Journal of Mansplaining, um, meaning that, you know, it's fine writing it and putting it out there, but um, who's it for? So, so our real challenge is to target the audiences we most need to get to, and that's not just other economists at retail banks. I like it. I'm here for it. Kudos to you for that. Mm. Let's talk about the numbers. And the numbers officially say that we are in a recession. It's pretty much what we all knew and felt mm. anyway. Does that mean that your work at the Reserve Bank is done? That you can back off the higher rates now? Or do you still feel like you need to see a bit more pain? Uh, I very much hope that we can. Um, we don't target recessions. We target low and stable inflation. Um, currently, I mean, it's um, very lag data, but you know we're at 4.7% CPI inflation. Our projections are we're below 3% and by the second half of this year. You will see a very happy central bank governor and monetary policy committee. Uh, and then we think we'll be able to start to renormalize interest rates. Uh, that's a global story. We're part of it. Um, I'm just back from the BIS internationally and all central bankers are uh, cautiously optimistic that um, uh, low inflation is now on the horizon. 
we are going to talk about inflation in a lot more depth. But you don't target a recession specifically, but you did engineer a downturn. That is correct, yeah? Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, monetary policy is about um, speeding up or slowing down spending behaviour through business cycles with the view of keeping inflation low and stable. Um, you know, a sense around a vehicle can only go so fast before it, before it gets out of control. Um, you know, the, the pace that that vehicle can go depends on how robust it is. Uh, this economy uh, was going beyond its speed limit uh, and inflation is the wobbly wheels and so we've had to slow that down deliberately uh, and that's what it is. We don't try to engineer a recession, we try to engineer growth that is below the supply capacity of the economy. Um, the fact that we're bumping around zero means our, our, our potential supply capacity has been very low. And one thing that has also been engineered, I guess, in a way, due to mm. those OCR hikes as well, is that there is a drop-off in debt demand. And I'm interested in how you think about this, because we've already seen some banks, ASB being one, cut their headline mortgage rates. Yeah. And how do you feel about that? Because I know you've said previously that it's a good thing to see banking competition, mm. but by actually putting pressure on real rates, now they're undoing quite a bit of your hard work. Uh, not so much. I mean, the competition wins hands down, you know, and may consumers demand more. I mean, we focus on the lending rates. What about, what about the deposit rates as well? You know, go and push your bank very hard or push other banks to say, what are you going to give me um, to deposit? The margins in the banking sector have been historically high, um, cyclically high, and what you're seeing there is competition starting to bring those margins back down to something more historically normal, and even that's high. So they're not undoing, our, our projections had uh, now, it's been stable for about 18 months, our projections of uh, an, you know, an effective mortgage interest rate of about 6.4% once everyone's rolled on. Uh, what you're seeing at the moment is rates coming down towards that rather than away from it. You've already spoken about this and we know that the main reason the economy is hurting right now is because inflation, or rather your measure of it, consumer prices are sitting at 4.7% mm. annually. I think the messaging, Governor, of what's caused that really matters. Mm. And I'm going to bring up a video, I'm not going to show you it, but I'll, but I'll yep. bring up something that was in it, that the Reserve Bank released about two weeks ago and it was titled, What is Inflation? I'm assuming you've seen it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. If I can quote you something that was in that, in that script that your economist said, it said, price increases like this across the economy are what we call inflation. This is because businesses will charge higher prices for their goods or services as long as their customers are willing to pay more. It sounds like from that script that inflation is being blamed on businesses and consumers, but was inflation not the expansion of money supply by the Reserve Bank through the LSAT bond buying program through low interest rates? Uh, so first of all, what The Economist is explaining there is there are relative prices. There's a price for any good or service, and we don't target any relative price. If a price of uh, an apple goes up because apples are, are scarce or, or the quality of the apple's gone up or suddenly sides, that's great. That's called a relative price. It's when the price of an apple goes up that then causes the prices of sandwiches to go up and then haircuts to go up and then so on and so forth where a relative price shock turns into generalised inflation. People use it as an excuse. It becomes then uh, embedded into people's expectations. If I think inflation is going to be even higher again next year, I'm going to demand more wages, I'm going to start putting up my prices, so on and so forth. And you get into this vicious spiral of expectations leading actual prices, leading expectations. But Governor, and that so, money came from somewhere. No, I mean, I'll come back to the cause. So I just do, want, I think it's really important people understand generalised inflation rather than relative prices there. Now, coming back to the cause of current inflation, it is a combination of demand exceeding supply, and it's a combination of complex things where the economy was shut down, our supply capacity collapsed. Uh, central banks globally, including us, as well as fiscal authorities, pumped money in to keep jobs and livelihoods going as we work through that period of extreme uncertainty. So we played the cards that we had in front of us at the time and that led to demand holding up, holding up stronger than expected actually because uh, people sat on their couches and ordered goods, goods to be delivered to the door. And so as we came out of that shock, once people knew we were going to survive, basically, uh, and um, you know, vaccines, 
we've had to remove that stimulus. So you're seeing that go through. So the monetary and fiscal policy is one aspect. Then you've got to add into significant global price shocks around uh, energy and food, um, record high levels. You think we had inflation peak at 7.4% here in New Zealand. It was over 20% in parts of Europe. Food and energy went through the roof, particularly with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And then on top of that, we've had other supply side shocks, uh, you know, where the economy keeps getting constrained. Labour wasn't allowed to move. Labour shortages were everywhere. Businesses fought each other for the same person to work. So wages were going high, and then we got hit with Cyclone Gabriel. So a whole series of uh, asymmetric shocks to the supply side of the economy. We've been pulling back on the demand, trying to see where do these things restabilise. I'm pleased to say now, uh, it's working as anticipated. But if we can just clear this up now then, it seems like from that answer that your actual definition of inflation is both the effect being price increases and also the cause. Is it's that a correct? Su a supply and demand. You can't never talk about one independently and you can never talk about one particular shock. This is why we do it every six weeks. You know, if, uh, um, you know our, our review of our monetary policy behaviour during the 2020 COVID period said we could have started tightening one to two quarters earlier, you know, four to eight months earlier. But even then, inflation still would have peaked near 7%. So that timing, you know, we were the first central bank out of the gates to start tightening monetary policy. If we'd been even earlier, if we'd had this amazing foresight of exactly what was going to happen, um, you know, that doesn't happen, uh, even then we still would have had high inflation because of those supply shocks. So. So it's, uh, inflation is always and everywhere monetary, but that depends monetary against what? The potential economy. How could a business grow or not raise prices if they couldn't get access to labour and had to pay a lot more? You know, that's just one simple example. But what was the intent behind avoiding mentioning the cause in these videos? I mean, you, you've said today that, you know, the cause is you know, was money printing to a certain degree, right? I, I, but, I don't but, think but any, I think you need to go beyond the video. As, as exciting as it is to see that, go and read our review. Um, that we are, I think we're still almost the only central bank in the world that has put out uh, a full review of our activity over the last five years and had it internationally peer-reviewed and come out with lessons learned and have a work program going on how we can learn from that experience. So please don't dumb your audience down by saying watch a video. I'm not, but it seems Go, that well, you, you are dumbing like it down are. in these videos because this this was a three and a half, very simple and effective and I understand that, but we've even spoken about how complex of a topic yeah. this can be. So it is that message that you put out was targeted towards most New Zealanders who don't understand things at depth. So I'm rather pointing I, out the I fact that it wasn't included in that. Uh, well, I think it's more about what is inflation, full stop. Was it, was it videoed as... How did we get here and why? Was that the name of the video? No, it wasn't. But, but do you not think that the cause is important in telling people what inflation is, especially if it's eroding people's Do you think we can power? achieve all that in a three-minute video, as opposed to people coming on to our website or listening or reading? We are the most transparent central bank in the world. Please give us some credit for that. And I did. I did at the beginning. Did I do. You? Yes, I did. Yeah, I, I and, said thank you and, for you know, when we look at the monetary policy so. statements for your readers, um, you know, like seriously, we've got to get beyond it. We can't hold everyone's hands to understand how to go about their life. This here, for your readers, covers everything with regard to how we see the economy moving forward, and we repeat it quarterly. Uh, the document on financial stability report provides exact answers around where we see the stability of the financial system, where we see the issues coming forward, how we see issues like financial inclusion, climate change, competition impacting on it. So move on, move on from the three minute video. Okay, um, cool. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's talk about tax cuts. I don't love to bring up politics, but what do you think about that? Uh, well, it's a political decision. We played the cards that are dealt to us, just like we played the Ukraine card, we played the um, COVID card. Um, you know, we're here to maintain low and stable inflation. We're here to maintain uh, a, a stable financial system. Uh, governments will choose to do what, what they do. Uh, we don't have inside running to policy. We receive the information from Treasury once it's official and agreed with Cabinet. Um, we receive the information more or less at the same time you do. 
and then we, we put it into the mix of, of what does it mean for monetary policy. Isn't the exact opposite of what we should be doing right now, though, given that inflation or your measure of it is still at 4.7%? I, I can't comment on government policy. That's, you know, that's the people's choice. I want to ask you about another comment that went viral recently. You made a comment at a finance and expenditure oh, yeah, select yeah, committee. Yeah. And if I can repeat it here, you said, central banking is a great business to be in, print money, and people believe it. I'm assuming it was a joke, was it? Uh, no, it's real. And also, you cut that quote short. I saw that it went viral because I said people believe it because it is a fiat currency. It is backed by current and all future taxpayers of New Zealand with a crown balance sheet. If you go back and look at the full review rather than the I've gone feral on a, on a sides there. Uh, and it is the definition of a fiat money. I use that as an explanation to show how it is far more sensible, stable particularly if you are targeting low and stable inflation because it means the purchasing power of that IOU note remains stable through time. It remains a means of exchange. It remains a store of value. It remains a unit of account. Very critical things to call it money. A cryptocurrency, a stable coin, are none of those. And this is where people get confused. So if you'd played the full quote, it may have been quite educative rather than outrageous. We print a number on a piece of plastic which is an IOU that people trust because of what's behind it. What's behind a Bitcoin? What's behind a stable coin, a cryptocurrency? They are none of those three things I mentioned. Unit of account, means of exchange or store of value. What happens if people stop believing in the money that you print? Uh, then you have situations like Argentina or Zimbabwe or Venezuela. Um, it's where people start to look for alternative means of exchange. Um, you know, this is it. I mean, history shows that people used to use rare shells on a beach as a means of exchange. Um, it's, you know, it is, it is the growth. I mean, the word bank, you know, comes from a river bank in Venice um, where people started to use uh, these IOUs as means of exchange. So this is global. It is a fiat currency. What it really highlighted to me, though, that comment, and I understand that it was a clip of a, of a much larger piece of content oh, that was, yeah. But it did point out to me that this is a trust-based system. Yeah. And we know that money, the whole idea of it, the concept of it, is centred mm. around trust and credibility. The trust that people's purchasing power will not be eroded. That's right. But our purchasing power has gone backwards. Yeah. Since 2018, I believe you got here in March 2018, according to your inflation calculator, our purchasing power has gone backwards by 19.4%. Yeah, which is and terrible. It, it is terrible. Mm. And, people's, and also, inflation has been outside its target range for three consecutive years now. Yeah. So what is ensuring that the New Zealand dollar still has that store of value that you say is important if the Reserve Bank isn't doing it right now? So it's interesting you asked um, a couple of things. First of all, that is bad. So inflation is evil. Our task is to get it to be low and stable. Uh, our task is to play against the environment we're in. So uh, no one is excited or proud that inflation has been outside of the target. It is just a reality of the economic chaos that has gone on in the last five years globally. You mentioned the New Zealand dollar. Um, you probably noticed that it's actually been stable against all other currencies around the world during this period. So it's not a relative New Zealand dollar problem, it is a global inflation problem. So our purchasing power of our currency outside of New Zealand have remained the same with other currencies, meaning it's a global shock, not a domestic one. Uh, meanwhile, domestically, this is why we are slowing spending and getting inflation low and stable. So, you know, that, that is the case. Uh, of course, what we can't do is, because there are no tools, there are no methods, in fact, I, when I was going through school, um, we had a government that tried to have inflation exactly where they wanted it every day, and that ended up in price controls, wage and price freezes, closed capital markets, import licensing, it's chaos. You know, we have chosen to have a floating exchange rate and a flexible inflation targeting, which is global best practice. When shocks happen, we can't immediately crank interest rates because it's one to two years before it even impacts on the economy. Or likewise, push them down. We have to try and steer through, let the relative prices work their way through, but have stable inflation. Every year, in fact it was late 2019, 
um, we were sitting here thinking, wow, business cycles have been cooled, inflation is low and stable, it's the great moderation. When I came to join the bank, people said, why are you going there? They're, they're redundant, they don't do anything. What's happened since, global COVID is just, it will be marked down as one of the most historically significant impacts on, on human welfare uh, in the last hundred years. We are still too close to it to have a perspective. Uh, the Ukraine, the geopolitical tensions, the end of the, the great China, um, low cheap goods, the climate change impacts happening around the world, these are all amazing, horrible shocks that are all one side on the relative price. Our projections are always based on no more shocks because we can't, by definition, forecast one. Yeah. Do you think that there is still general trust in the central banking system? Oh, completely. Yeah. You? It's not up to me to decide. Well, it is. You're a member of New Zealand. You're a republic. So uh, do you hold a New Zealand dollar bank account? Do yes, you... I do, and I earn in New Zealand dollars, which have gone backwards. Uh, yeah. Do you, uh, do you uh, save in a New Zealand financial institution? Yes, I do. Well, there we go. Then you're, you're expressing trust in what you're doing. And these are all of the things that we work very hard to earn. Our, our work is around uh, trust of the financial system. Uh, we want participation, inclusion in the financial system, and that's a real challenge at the moment. Uh, we want uh, participation, particularly as banks are, are de-risking, moving out, people are finding it harder to get access to the products or the cash services they want. We're working very hard on that. Uh, we want competition and efficiency in our financial system, but not to the point where, it, where people are just losing money by, by tomorrow's next shiny thing. Um, going on, you know, these are critically dear to our heart. And, and this is, you know, again, referring to the documents, why we do what we do. But if we take me, for example, as you, as you raised, I earn in New Zealand dollars, I want to save in New Zealand dollars, but the amount I save is literally going backwards every single year. And isn't it your role to ensure that that doesn't happen? Uh, my role is to make sure consumer price inflation remains low and stable. Um, I can't help you in your career. Um, that is all we are tasked to do, as well as make sure that the financial system and the institutions that you choose to use are stable. It's not a, it's not a zero failure regime, it's a regime where you have the confidence that it's a store of value, that, that it's going to be there when I next need it. So, you know, um, uh, that's what it is. By the way, um, I struggle to think of any other country in the world that you could have gone to and you wouldn't have had the same story. Um, where? We had one of the lowest inflation rates in the OECD, but it was still outside our target band. But we still currently have one of the highest. Others have uh, come down much quicker. Uh, I'm really looking forward to more regular data, because you're talking about data that's monthly in most countries, but quarterly in this country, which is a significant bugbear of um, the Reserve Bank. You're talking about data of December last year. Um, I was just coming out, I was listening on the radio, where are food prices now? I didn't listen to the radio this morning. I was preparing for this. Uh, well, food prices are in negative territory. You know, so, so these things are moving all of the time. Uh, we need to make um, expectations. We, you know, um, our, our view is inflation will be back below 3%. The fact that inflation is taking a while to come down here in New Zealand is, uh, um, excuse me, is, is also a reflection on uh, uh, how small, uh, a lack of competition in some key markets, uh, continued supply constraints and our ability to produce goods and services, a high dependence on, on imported goods. So, you know, it's, um, every country is quite unique, but we are well within the OECD norms. Can I mention also we've achieved the slowdown in inflation to date with still, um, you know, minimum impact on the labour market. Again, when I went to school, when we went through, we were at 11% unemployment. Uh, trying to get inflation down. So we've learnt a lot. You mentioned stability and that other piece that the Reserve Bank also works on. I want to just briefly ask you about regulation before we wind this up. Um, on the capital requirements that you've implemented a couple of years ago, you re recently released one of those bulletin articles that explained how banks are going yep. with that. And the big four are on their way to 18% of yes. capital buffers by 2028. They're currently at around 12%. But excuse me if this is a bit of a naive question, but what happens if there is a 
big bank run or withdrawal of more than 12 percent today. What measures does, does the Reserve Bank have? Well, that's, you know, so the capital measure is one critical one. How much, how much of people's money or, or the equity are you going to keep in the bank yourself? Because banks, you know, the, the, the irony of a bank is they are highly leveraged institutions. I think uh, for every dollar they take on deposit, they lend about eight. And so, um, uh, so you know, that, that's the lever. We're saying hold enough capital that under most circumstances, you know, we, we talk about a one in 200 year type event sometimes, that you will have enough skin in the game that you can still meet um, the needs of the public. We also have plenty of other tools. We don't just sit there and say, hold that capital. We have liquidity requirements, so they have to be able to show how much ready cash they've got, you know, to meet those, if, if suddenly demand for, for deposits are there, show us how you can meet, meet those. And we have a significant array of regu regulatory expectations, you know, if anything, they tell us, oh, there are too many regulations. So, you know, it, it's a belt and braces to make sure that these systemically important institutions, um, if they do fail, they don't bring the system down. Uh, and the likelihood of their failing is very small. And that's, that's our challenge. Notice I didn't say zero failure. There's no such thing. Um, so that's, you know, that's where consumers have to, have to take real note of, hey, are, are, you, are you good for this? Do you, you know, um, and that's where we make all that disclosure and transparency. You've spoken about deposit rates as well, and they've blown out, right? So banks' liabilities have increased. They need to pay more customers out in... Yeah. higher deposit yep. rates. Yep. How do you think or worry about that perhaps, given that their liabilities are growing but they are going to increasingly have to put more money aside? Yeah. Do those things add up? Uh, I don't worry about it. That's their daily business. So, you know, the banks need to attract cash in, money in, so they can lend out and they make the difference between what they pay for the cash coming in and what they lend out on. That's the business of banking. Uh, they often borrow short, lend in, um, borrow short and lend longer and so there's also that mismatch and hence the liquidity etc going on. Um, for banks, the sources of money they get is either you know, equity out there from, from the share market, they can attract deposits or they themselves can go out and borrow off international markets from that side and it's always a combination of those. Most recently it's been heavily weighted to borrowing offshore and that's where the lower interest rates were. That's not so much the case now as central banks around the world have done exactly like us, all have tight interest rates. And so they're now needing to rely more on attracting deposits. And so that's, you know, that's the natural business. The margin still remains very healthy. Yeah, it certainly does. And I just want to finish on a last question. You mentioned that you were one of the first central banks in the world to increase rates mm. throughout the sort of COVID pandemic economic cycle. But we might be one of the last to cut, perhaps, depends if the Fed goes mm. first. The world's watching. How does that sit with you? Um, we need to play the cards that are in front of us. Um, it's kind of interesting. I was just busy explaining to a lot of real money funds uh, in London last week. Uh, you know, we have our own currency, we have our own exchange rate, and New Zealand has its own inflation rate. That's what we target. We're not trying to target what the US Fed is looking at. They've got their own problems. And so we will take what time is needed to nail low inflation and anchor inflation expectations. Because you've just told me you've lost 19% of real income so um, uh, to inflation. Um, that's a global story. We need to focus on our component. Thanks for your time, Governor. Appreciate it. Kia ora. Thank you. You know what I thought after that interview? How lucky am I to live in a country where I can ask those questions? I really don't love confrontation and I never aim to gotcha anybody. But the governor himself even said at the end that he respected why I had to ask the questions that I did. And to the tone of transparency, that was the full unedited interview. He even invited me back to do it again another time. Please do let me know your thoughts on this interview. I really want to hear them because it only makes this show better. Now go put your money to work. Thanks for watching Markets with Madison, the New Zealand Herald show for interested investors. If you want to stay up to date with financial markets, click the subscribe button below and you can watch our other episodes here. Stay up to date with all the business news and numbers as they land on nzherald.co.nz.